think as a whole, we've got um, a lot of work to do. When you look at the rest of data, we're thinking about equality, we're thinking about diversity, we're thinking about representation on, at a senior level. And if you look at some of the data that we already have, there's 12% of BME staff at Band 7 and above. What work is being done? How can we champion that progress? What support can we actually give the BME network and some of the BME staff to actually move from where they are to where they need to be? So within this organisation, you can see that the work, the journey has started. And when you look at the kind of topic we have for today, we're at different places, but it's the same journey. Jennifer does, has done a lot of work around cultural intelligence. And in a mental health trust, we want to understand emotional intelligence. And I think understanding cultural intelligence actually puts it all in a very beautiful package for our staff to be able to work well with uh, I guess maybe service users and also with colleagues. So cultural intelligence uh, looks at the capabilities and the abilities of people to work effectively in diverse cultural contexts. And culture um, is used very widely, so it's not just looking at ethnicity or nationality, it's looking at the, the, the values, the habits, the behaviours that put, bind together certain groups of people. And that's what's so exciting about it, because it's really looking at equipping people with transferable skills. I think what I like best about it is that you, unlike things with unconscious bias where you're just almost defining the problem, with cultural intelligence you're able to equip people with the skills to create solutions and solutions that work in terms of inclusion, in terms of productivity and people's personal effectiveness. You may not have a high, high level of cultural intelligence simply because you haven't been exposed to a lot of different cultures. Um, on your journey and actually that's okay and whether we're working with patients who come from different cultural backgrounds whether we're working with partners different hospitals different trusts voluntary sector the private sector culture exists everywhere culture matters and how we engage with culture matters so leaders with high CQ will create more inclusive, compassionate working environments for people with difference. They will work more effectively. They will understand how to bring out the best in their team members, irrespective of their backgrounds. When you run a workshop on cultural intelligence, you see the light bulb just coming on for people and people are saying, oh, well, this, I can see how this impacts my personal life as well as my professional life. Now, Dame Elizabeth talks mainly about her journey. That's it helped her to get where she is. I self-published my book just three, just under three years ago and the motivation was friends and colleagues who were really quite shocked when they heard about my early childhood and adolescence. So I called it Mixed Blessings from a Cambridge Union because I actually the outcome of an affair of two Cambridge University students just after the Second World War. One was my mother, that's me with her, I'm nine months old at this stage. She was born in England, but of Irish Catholic heritage. The first to go to university, studied classics at Newnham College, very, very, very bright. And she met my father, Nigerian, at the university. He was studying law, and, but they never married. And my mother came from a strict religious background. And in that era, she couldn't even bring herself to tell her parents that she was pregnant. They discovered it. All she had told them was my father was a student at the same university. They'd assumed I was white. And it wasn't until I was born that they saw this brown baby. So that added another level of stigma and shock. Therefore, I lived in a children's home for the first nine years of my life. Mainly positive, some of it not so positive. I then lived with my mother and my stepfather. Unfortunately, he physically abused me. My grandparents, my maternal grandparents, rescued me as a teenager. And I then came down to London um, at 18 to, to study nursing. My mother all, never gave me up for adoption. I never, ever had a sense of rejection from her. So I think those were some of the key factors, plus people who helped me along the way, even though I wouldn't have expected help from certain people. They, they saw something in me and helped me. And I, I really blossomed from there. And I've got a family of my own. I became a professor of nursing. And uh, we made a day, <laughs> as, you, as you do, you know. So it shows that sometimes life can turn out really quite sweet.
we're all here for one purpose, to make the service user's journey within mental health and physical health much more uh, smooth and also should be compassionate and to look after their whole well-being. Now, how can we do that if you feel that as a practitioner, a part of you is not being acknowledged or not being um, explored or you're not using the whole part of you. So we're getting there, we're working, it's progressive. If you heard what the CEO said today, it's quite, it's representing the feelings and what the staff members are saying. So the journey is good, but we could do better. So to bring all these people together with a chief executive doing an opening, I think it's been a very wonderful event. And I think, or I know, that today has been a very good day.